Okay, we are live. Welcome, everyone. Some of you are already filling out our poll. Thank you. So we have a, a poll there in the chat, either to the right or below the presentation, depending on which type of device you're using. And we're just curious what brings you here today. Are you a parent? Are you a professional? Are you a student? Is there something else, some other way you'd identify yourself and your reason for being here? You'll just take that poll. If you have any questions or comments, you can go ahead and put those in the chat, um, which you should be able to see down below or to the side as well. There should be a thing that says, type your comment. Welcome. So you're all flooding into the room. <laughs> It's exciting to have over 100 people together in a time in our, our world when that is not allowed currently. So um, I'm imagining you all joining us here in a big group. It's exciting. Good morning. Love to see those good mornings filing in. Hello, Daphne, Rosa, Robin, Alejandra, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. This is wonderful. We're so glad you're here. All right. It looks like the majority of you are professionals working with young children and families, and that is what we accepted. Um, but anyone else that is joining us, students, um, others, you are so welcome here in this space today. We are excited about our topic. My name is Carla Ritz. I'm the executive director of First Five Lake County, and we um, hold the webinar jam platform. So we are hosting today. And I just want you to know that um, your video and audio will not be activated during our webinar, but if you are very welcome to interact with us through the chat feature where you can either send a comment that everyone can see or just the administrators. Also, I just wanted you to know that today's um, webinar is being recorded. So we will have playback for you at uh, later this afternoon that we'll send out a link for. Thank you for joining us. Let's get started. I'm going to introduce to you uh, Dr. Barbara Ivins. She is the Director of Early Intervention Services at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland. In addition to overseeing that program and providing direct services to children, she has provided training, supervision, and consultation within the Bay Area early childhood mental health community and all systems of care that serve young children for more than 35 years. First Five Lake and other First Fives throughout the more rural parts of Northwest region of California became connected with Barbara when she became the co-director of the SAMHSA-funded Infancy and Early Childhood Mental Health Consortium through UCSF's Department of Psychiatry. And we have been so honored to be working with her these past several months. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Barbara so that she can tell us all more about that program and to introduce you to today's trainer. Take it away, Barbara. Thank you, Carla, so much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. This is new for all of us, but um, it's a real silver lining of what's happening that we can come together as a region uh, and participate together in trainings like this. Carla, that was a fantastic introduction, and I am here today as the co-director of our SAMHSA-funded grant, where we have brought three signature programs in the Bay Area, the Child Trauma Research program, of which Alicia Lieberman is the director, the Infant Parent Program, and my program, Early Intervention Services, together as a training consortium. And with our funds, we are 18 months into a five-year grant where we are working to create a strong infant and early childhood workforce in 10 counties north of us, which include all of the counties in which you are now um, joining us today. So. In your file section on the side on Webinar Jam, you will see a menu of our training options. And over the next few years, we will continue to partner with First Five and with you to try and build a strong and vigorous workforce in your area. So please take advantage of our free trainings and be in touch with us. We have a Facebook page, Zero to Five Workforce, which you will hear about as well. But I am here this morning to introduce you to Dr. Alicia Lieberman. She is, in addition to being the principal investigator of our grant. She's importantly the director of the Child Trauma Research Program, which is at the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. That program, which has been in existence now for 25 years, 
uh, focuses on research training and the treatment of young children with trauma. And Alicia is a local, national, and internationally known and recognized expert on teaching, training, and clinical work with infants and young children. She has been recognized most recently with the Lifetime Achievement Award, Award by the National Organization Zero to Three, and she is a gifted speaker, trainer, and thinker. I have known her for 35 years and learned from her every day. Importantly, she's the grandmother of two young children, and I am delighted that she is here to share her wisdom with us today, and we'll be talking about listening to children's fears, COVID as an aid to empathy. Alicia? Thank you so much, Barbara, for this wonderful introduction. Thank you, Carla, for making this opportunity possible. And thank you all for coming today so that we can think together about these difficult times. And um, I often find that it's situations of stress that bring the most um, evolved, the best parts of ourselves. And I hope that as we think together about the eloquence with which children tell us about their fears, we can also become more empathic to our own because I think that the fears that we're experiencing right now are universal fears and we can all help each other in finding ways of coping and um, surmounting the stresses that we're experiencing. Um, I'd like to start by reminding ourselves that there is a lot of joy even in the midst of hardship and that children are our teachers in reminding us about the joy of discovery, discovering the world, discovering each other, discovering new resources within ourselves, the developmental stages that young children are experiencing in terms of learning to walk, learning to talk, learning what they are able to do, learning to rely on others for help when they cannot do it themselves. These are all the ABCs of our everyday life. And I think uh, thinking of how much we learn from children in their appreciation of life and their appreciation of relationships can rekindle, I hope, our vitality as we cope with these difficult times. And there's also the counterbalance to wonder, which is the normative anxieties, the expectable anxieties, the regular fears that emerge in the first five years of life. And once they emerge, they become our lifelong companions so that they get rekindled when there are stresses, either from the environment or from our own internal processes. And these are the fears of losing someone we love, the fear of losing the love and approval of people who are important to us, the fear of being hurt, the fear of dying, which is essentially a fear of body damage, and the most advanced fear to emerge developmentally in the preschool years, four years old, five year olds, is a fear that we're not up to snuff, that we're not living up to what people expect of us, that we are somehow at fault. And I think that this is a particularly um, prevalent fear right now for so many of us who feel that the challenges are enormous, that the sources of suffering are so great, and that our own contributions can be so small relative to what is needed. And that fear that we're not good enough, I think needs to be put in the context of our humility in understanding that we all need each other, 
that each one is doing their part and that we are doing the best we can so that we can be forgiving and accepting of ourselves as we cultivate an attitude of forgiveness and acceptance of others as well, and particularly of the children that depend on us. Together with the normative anxieties, there are the normative parental functions in caregiving, in raising children, and parents have a lot to do. Often they have to do it all at the same time. They have to protect from danger. They have to caregive in terms of feeding, bathing, changing, keeping uh, protect, keeping clean, keeping healthy. They have to teach children what is right and what is wrong so that they learn the standards of society. They have to teach children what is real and what is pretend, what is fantasy and what is true. And in the midst of it all, they have to give children a sense that life is meaningful, that life is worth living. There are lots of cultural differences in how we do this, but all cultures have these primary uh, functions for parents. And among cultural differences of which I'm very aware because I am an immigrant, even though I've been here for almost 50 years, my roots in Paraguay, my home country are still very, very active with me. And one of the ways, for example, that I find cultural differences is in the way more traditional cultures expect a sense of collectivism and responsibility to the family versus, for example, mainstream uh, culture in the United States placing a lot of emphasis on the individual and on being autonomous. And I often think that is the point counterpoint between belonging and autonomy that provides for a healthy personality. So the different cultures in the United States have much to give each other. And I think that is something to remember at this time when we can be so much at odds with each other across our differences. Parents need external supports and a sense of emotional well-being to fulfill their parental functions. And this is one of the sad things about COVID that it has exposed in stark relief the ways in which our social contract has broken down for many years now the way that uh, the, the, the safety net that we all owe to each other and particularly to families with children and particularly to families with young children, that safety net is in tatters. And as a result, parents are overwhelmed by their concrete needs and their difficult the in fulfilling their parental functions because they are so much under stress. And in this context, I think it's important to remember that emotions are contagious, both the positive emotions and the negative emotions, and that children absorb our emotional state. They are like little sponges with big ears, as my colleague Chandra Ghosh Ipen likes to say. They hear everything that we say. They interpret it from their developmental stage. They are constantly monitoring our facial expressions. And they attribute to themselves the responsibility for our emotion. It very often they think that it is their fault that we are upset or that they we are angry or that we uh, are not patient. And this is a reminder that each of the normative caregiving functions is 
vulnerable to stress and trauma. And this is, I think, the reason for our coming together today to reflect on the specific ways in which uh, these functions might be vulnerable to the stresses that we are experiencing right now. So this is a reminder that reality matters and that it affects our sense of safety and trust. Poverty, illness, discrimination, COVID is as real as it gets. We know from many national statistics that the first three to five years of life are the most dangerous in a child's life. Not only are young children more vulnerable to accidental injury, to, for example, uh, accidental poisoning, to falls, to burns, to near drownings. They are also most vulnerable to child abuse and to witnessing domestic violence. And this time of enforced sheltering in place has already shown us that there have been exponential increases in reports of domestic violence, together with a very worrisome decrease in reports of child abuse. One of the things that I do have done for many, many years now is serve as a <coughs> consultant to Child Protective Services in uh, um, the city and county of San Francisco on a weekly basis. I meet with child protective workers and with supervisors, and we have been talking about how now that children are not in school, are not out and about, are not in summer camp, there are fewer eyes on them. And there has been a very significant decrease in child abuse reports, which we worry are going to be it is going to be a sign that after we are back uh, in the public sphere, we will find that there has been a silent epidemic of child abuse that mirrors the epidemic of domestic violence that we are uh, finding is happening. And I think that to the extent that we can keep an eye on how children are doing, how parents are doing, we can try to see how we can position ourselves to serve as sources of protection. I think reality is important not only in terms of what happens, but also in terms of how reality confirms the normative fears. Because when children are hit, when children are witnessing strife at home, those expectable anxieties are confirmed by reality. And the child interprets the external situation as meaning, I am going to be left, I am not loved, my body is going to be hurt, and the fact that my mom and my dad, my the people that care for me are angry and upset means that I am not good enough. So children are constantly interpreting what happens around them among the people they love in the context of how are they responsible for it. And the way they respond, the way we all respond to situations of danger is with a classic biologically driven uh, survival mechanisms of either fighting in an effort to protect ourselves or taking off, fleeing, running away, or freezing in place in an effort to make ourselves very, very small. These external behaviors become internal mechanisms so that freezing can become a numbing of emotion. Fighting can become a constant stance of being aggressive and fleeing can become a form of avoiding interaction with others, wanting to be out 
of connection. COVID and sheltering in place mean that we need to adjust to new stresses. We not only are afraid of known dangers like illness and death, but COVID has also given us a lot of uncertainty about the future. So that our minds are always hovering around the question, what will happen if? What will happen if we lose our job? What will happen if we lose our housing? What will happen if we don't have enough to eat? What will happen if I cannot protect our children? The financial repercussions can go from minor to very, very, very stark as reflected in the long um, lines around food banks, for example, and in reports in the newspapers about how children are coming to school hungry and how teachers are trying their best to find often out of their own pockets how to help them with that hunger. And sheltering in place also brings physical constraints. And for many parents who need to work from home and who need to continue meeting expectations from workplaces that have not relaxed their expectations of productivity in recognition of how hard it is to parent at the same time that one works, there is no safety belt particularly if parents do not have access to other adults in the home that can help them in the balance between work and caregiving. And as we reflect on all these new stresses, I think that it's worthwhile, I think it's helpful to think of stress and as a continuum that goes from normative, developmentally appropriate, expectable stress to traumatic stress. Normative, developmentally appropriate stress is part and parcel of everyday life. For example, when young children start going to childcare, it is a stressful time as all of us who work with young children or who have young children know they cry, they don't want to separate from us. They can't wait to come home. But this stress, when handled appropriately, builds their emotional muscles. They, it expands their horizons. It helps them make new connections. It helps them learn in new ways. It's a stress that is manageable and it's appropriate and serves as an impetus to growth. Then in the middle, there is stress that is not necessarily developmentally appropriate, but that the world sends at us, or that is the stress of repeated chronic uh, circumstances that are difficult. And COVID fits in the situationally appropriate stress. And depending on our circumstances, the coping mechanisms and the environmental supports that we have, it can be manageable to quite difficult to manage. And at the end of the continuum, there is traumatic stress. Traumatic stress happens when danger happens unpredictably, unexpectedly, and we do not have the resources to cope with it in the moment. A car accident, for example, that threatens life and physical integrity, a severe car accident, or the catastrophic illness of somebody that we know or somebody that we love, our own catastrophic illness. Those are traumatic stresses that leave us, take our breath away and take a long time for us to start building the resources to continue coping or to recover from that fear. So 
as we think of ourselves and as we think of the children we know and the families we know, we can think of a, an interplay between the size of the objective danger and the extent of our coping resources, both in terms of our temperament, our personality, our resilience, but also in terms of how comfortable we are financially, how uh, safe we are in terms of having savings, for example, for a rainy day or not, how stable our housing is. And many people are saying that we're all in this together. I think that I would prefer to quote somebody who was unnamed, but who I read this in a newspaper who said we're in the same storm, but we're not in the same boats. Some of us have very sturdy boats. Other of us are in very rickety boats. People who are unemployed, people who don't have resources to rely on are having a much more difficult time. And we can also talk about the fact that people of color, Black Americans and Latinx uh, people are disproportionately dying. Asian people in the Bay Area are also disproportionately affected by um, COVID. The, con the reasons for that are still not thoroughly understood, but certainly poverty and lack of access to health resources is at least one of the components. So as we work with families and children, it's really important for us to think of, as we try to understand their behavior and their emotional responses, what are their circumstances? What, what is the size of their boat in the context of the storm that they are facing? And in that sense, I think we all have new roles because we cannot be as physically close to the families and the children that we serve as we would like to do. And what I've been finding as my own program has moved from 100% face-to-face uh, therapy to 100% telehealth, therapy is that it's amazing how these sessions can foster closeness, can foster intimacy. Uh, one little boy, for example, for the first time was able to talk with his mother about his fear when he saw his stepfather hurt her and he enacted it in a way that really conveyed both to the mother and to the therapist how closely he had been watching and how scared he had been. This is a little boy that had not been able to talk about it in actual face-to-face -face sessions. So there is something sometimes for some children and some families where the telephone or the slightly a bigger distance that telehealth creates makes it safer to visit difficult emotions. Another little girl started playing with a camera of Zoom to go on and off, on and off as a way of playing peekaboo when the therapy started talking about how was it for her that she could not visit her mom because she was in custody, uh, physical custody with her dad and the regular visits that she had with her mom could not happen because of sheltering in place. And I think that the common denominators for us as service providers is showing an interest in the immediate safety of the family. How are they doing? How are they managing? and validating their feelings 
as legitimate responses to a difficult and unpredictable situation. And then thinking of ways that we can help them move along that continuum from unmanageable situational stress to more manageable, almost in the norm, in the realm of normative by reminding them that everybody is experiencing these situations and by helping them think about uh, effective forms of problem solving. Now, in this um, new normal, I think that it's really important to remember that young children's out of control behaviors may be signs either of just being sick and tired of being inside, not having access to predictable routines, or they may also be signs of traumatic stress. There are children who have long and prolonged tantrums who become very aggressive. And I think that if we can find ways of inquiring tactfully about the circumstances of the family and what might be affecting the children, we might be able to identify risks. One example with an older child that we experience is uh, when the mother uh, reported that the child had been in his room and refused to go out. And um, the therapist started asking, what happened? Um, when did it start? Uh, Etc. And it emerged, and this is something that the mother herself had not realized. It emerged after a situation where she engaged in a very dysregulated shouting match with her landlord, who was telling her that he did not know for how long he would be able to forgive, even though it is illegal now to evict people. He was threatening her with eviction and the mother became very, very, very dysregulated and understandably so, and started threatening uh, with calling the police. And the child became so frightened that he thought that the mother was going to call the police on him because he had misbehaved and he was hiding in his room. So that I think sometimes taking the time to go into detail about what happened, how can we understand what happened before this behavior, what could have led to this behavior, can give us an understanding of the meaning of behavior because these circumstances are also leading to changes in the parent-child relationship where they often blame each other for the situation that they are in and they can become triggers for each other. Where, for example, this child was experiencing the mother as a potential source of danger if she called the police on him and this mother was feeling that this child was responding in a totally um, abnormal way to just everyday life so that there begin to be negative attributions, negative perceptions that can often escalate and create miscommunication between the parent and the child. As we try to give meaning to behavior, all of so many of you are professionals working with children, and you know that we need to use a developmental frame. We need to remember what are the strengths, what are the vulnerabilities, what are the normative anxieties of this age, but also individual characteristics, temperament, um, personality, and the environment, what are the cultural expectations, what is the quality of attachment, what's the history of trauma, and 
what are the historical circumstances? Is this a family that belongs to a, a cultural group that has experienced a lot of historical trauma that is now become more real in the here and now so that historical trauma becomes present day culturally sanctioned trauma? And all of these are manifested in the normative stresses and exacerbate them. And I just want to revisit quickly the different fears and think of strategies to help them. The fear of separation is the earliest fear to emerge in the first um, six to eight months of a child's life. And essentially is a lack of object constancy. Is the child not knowing if out of sight, if out of sight means out of existence, because certainly out of sight is not out of mind for the child. The child has an internal representation of the parent and longs for the parent and the fear of losing the parent is very real. And I think different cultures have universal themes of reassuring with those fears, peekaboo, hide and seek, saying I will always come back, saying goodbye so that the child knows that we're leaving and saying hello and making a little ritual out of the separation and the reunion, leaving the child with people that they trust using transitional objects saying, I'm not here, but you can play with your little um, stuffed animal while I'm gone. And again, paying attention to the reunions. The fear of losing love emerges in the, in the uh, 12 to 18 months of life and shows the child struggling with the idea of how to reconcile the inevitable conflicts of everyday life. The fact that parents don't always do what we want them to do. Teachers don't always do what we want them to do. And does that mean that they don't love us? We all love for unconditional love and very few of us are able to either provide it or to receive it. I think that the human condition is a constant alternation between loving unconditionally, but then relapsing into disappointment, irritation, anger. And the main thing is to go back to a loving stance where we can be clear that the fact that we might disapprove or we have to socialize does not mean that we don't love. And recognizing that ambivalence is a universal human condition. And I think at this point when everybody is feeling so vulnerable emotionally and physically, the idea of withdrawing love, which is often used as a socialization tool in many cultures, is probably something that we might want to relax. I think that children right now are so frightened by the loss of predictability in daily routines, by the stresses that their parents and themselves are experiencing, that reassuring about our love can be a tremendous pillar of safety for them. Uh, even if we continue enforcing expectations, because I think enforcing expectations of what is approved, what is not approved, what's allowed, what is not allowed, gives the children a North Star of this is how I need to continue growing. Fear of that body damage is, of course, um, very prevalent right now. We all have it. Um, there are unexpected physical challenges uh, for young children losing balance and falling 
is one way that many, many children show that they are emotionally uh, not feeling balanced. Um, children are afraid of losing parts of the body, having their hair cut, having their nails cut, being toilet trained sometimes can be very difficult because this idea of flushing a precious part of their body, a precious product of their body down the toilet can be quite frightening for some children. And again, here cultures have emerged, have developed wonderful healing rituals. Um, in Spanish, which is my mother tongue, uh, we we have a little song called Sana Sana Colita de Rana, which is like heal heal little tushy of of a a, a frog. Uh, in English, there are other um, healing rituals, and those can be so helpful right now, even if there isn't an observable um, ouchie. Uh, in terms of reassuring children that um, that they are going to be taken care of in their body. And the most um, damning fear of all, in a way, the fear that we're bad, and the question of, if I don't please you, if you are ma mad at me, does it mean that, you, that am I bad? Um, I think that, um, you all know this, helping children differentiate the fact that I don't like what you did doesn't mean that I don't love you and I don't think that you are a wonderful child. And I will continue teaching you what you are supposed to learn because you are still little and you are still learning and everybody learns all the time. And sometimes it takes more than one time to learn something some things are difficult to learn. I think one of the um, important lessons to remember in this time is the idea that everything that ever happened to us in our past keeps is alive in us and comes tumbling down into the present so that the experiences of rejection, the experiences of pain, the experiences of suffering that we had as young children, as older children, as teenagers, are often evoked by our current circumstances. And as we try to help children and parents as we try to help ourselves, it is often useful if our own role is appropriate to ask what does the current condition remind them of? Did they ever experience something like this before? Um, and often that can come as a way of giving meaning to behavior that can be very reassuring and healing, both for parents and for children. One example that, I, that I'd like to offer is um, a father who was extremely angry at his four-year-old because the four-year-old uh, used a curse word in uh, um, responding to him. And the father um, felt that this was going to be a sign that the child was going to become a delinquent. And the um, clinician working with him said, did anybody ever call you that word before, that word before? And this was a person, a father of color, and it turned out that this same word had been used with him repeatedly, both in the streets as he was growing up and even in the work, uh, the piece of work. So when his child said it to him, it evoked 
a fear that he was never going to overcome that epithet and that his child was going to become a perpetrator, just like the people in his life had been perpetrators. At that moment, he lost track of the fact that this was a four-year-old and that he needed to be taught how not to use dirty words. But remembering the context for his reaction helped him put the child back in this developmental stage of his four. And this is the time for him to learn. And this is the time for you to teach him. And it restored a sense of connection between the father and the child. So in this sense, parents can become a secure base for their children where their authentic connection around this regulation, around repair, becomes a, a source of healing. And I think the first step in that is acknowledging fear as a trigger for anger, as a trigger for alienation, as a trigger for dysregulation, and then using attachment, using the connection as a way of thinking together about what can serve to protect. Um, I, my team and I have developed the concept of speaking the unspeakable to talk about the importance of putting fears into words. And I will, um, that doesn't mean that we hit people over the head with traumatic um, stories or asking them to talk about the most painful parts of their experience. It has to be a tactful, well-timed uh, conversation. But I'll give you an example. There was a little uh, four-year-old who um, kept playing that he was dead. He would lie down on the floor and say, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. And his mother said, stop playing that you are not dead. Nobody is dead. We're okay. And the child would not follow her request and kept playing it day in and day out several times a day and it overwhelmed her. The clinician said to her, have you ever talked to him about the virus? And she said, he's too little and I don't know how to talk to him about the virus. And the clinician said, you know, he's too little, he is little, but he is so smart and he's constantly listening to what the TV says, what the radio says, what you and your um, husband say, what you and your, they, they lived in an extended family and your mom and dad are saying, and I think he's trying to make sense of it. I think he probably understands that there's something dangerous going on. And the mother turned to the child and said, are you afraid of dying? And he said, yes. And I'm afraid that you will die. And for the mother, this was a revelation. This child also had a huge tantrum two days earlier when he saw the grandma wearing a mask. And she was wearing a mask because she was on her way out, but nobody had explained to him that masks serve as a protective function. And he thought that she was sick and she was going to die. And so this idea of speaking the unspeakable is meant to bring our attention to 
what could be happening here that we're not talking about? That, but that the child is trying to make sense of. And how can we put it in words that are manageable for the child? Um, and this consists then of building a partnership where in this case, the clinician was helping the mother build a, an explanation that built bridges between her own sense of this is not something that we can talk about because it's too little and the child's sense of grown-ups are talking about death and about illness and I don't understand it and I'm really scared that that means that I'm going to die and my mom is going to die and building bridges between narratives that are not connecting with each other finding ways of coping with incompatible agendas that when one looks at the common denominator of safety and connection can become compatible and of course we all fight we all get disconnected with each other the most important thing is to remember there is always the opportunity to repair there is always the opportunity to say, I'm sorry, I did not mean to hurt you. I did not mean to hurt your feelings. Making up after a fight and reassure each other that we're not going to leave each other. We're not going to stop loving each other. We're not going to. It doesn't mean that we are bad or that the other person is bad. We're not going to hurt each other physically. Those are really the north stars of emotional health and of course that means that we need to care for ourselves and here i want to tell you something that i've learned from my colleagues who work with mindfulness and they have found that 60 to 90 seconds may suffice if they are repeated little episodes that are repeated through the day to help us calm down. And we can do all kinds of things in those 60 to 90 seconds. We can go inwards, name how we're feeling, and then, because naming the feeling in itself is healing. Naming the feeling and then thinking of something that helps us. It can be a prayer. It can be looking through the window at a tree or at flowers or at the sky, at clouds. It can be singing a little song to ourselves. It can be looking at the photograph of somebody we love. It can be breathing in, breathing out. It could be stretching. Each of us has our own different strategies and then that takes us back to a place of keeping things in perspective that can bring us back to the job that we need to do so i hope this has given um, some useful ideas and i look forward to your questions thank you very much for being here Alicia, thank you so much for um, for this really hour's worth of wisdom. I have been monitoring the chat and um, people are reflecting out loud on many of the things that you said that really are so helpful and resonate with them. Um, things that have been mentioned is the, uh, the really beautiful metaphor you make about the different boats that we're in, um, normative stress helping us uh, be experienced for building our emotional muscles the whole idea of what our North Stars are, all of the normative anxieties and how they may be exacerbated in the reality of what we're all living with uh, today and um, remembering to have a developmental lens and um, everything about connection and repairing. So I really wanna thank you for all of that. I wanna remind everyone that you will find um, Alicia's book in the offers 
um, section on webinar at JAM, which uh, shows you the front piece of her book, The Emotional Life of the Toddler. And I also want to remind people that um, we will have a link uh, that I think Carla will put up for us in the chat room. And we will also email to you afterwards, which will link you to a survey uh, about this. It's extremely helpful to us if you will fill out the survey because we learn a little bit more about who you are. And it also helps us in our grant bring more trainings to you that really work uh, for your community. So please do that. It's very helpful. We also, if you fill out our survey, we like to attach that in a fun way to a raffle for some of the things that we have, which includes Alicia's book and some um, great bags and other things with reminder words of um, what we have here. So please look for that in the chat and for our email, which will link that to the survey. I'm looking to see if anyone has any questions right before we go. Lots of thank yous, Alicia, in terms of doing this. And um, I want to thank you as well on behalf of everybody and everyone who attended today. Thank you so much. You. Carla? Hi. This, yeah, I just noticed that we do have some questions. Um, if we have, we have maybe five minutes left. So uh, the first question was, when a child has multiple tantrums throughout the day, how would you suggest helping a parent to help their child? Uh, th this is one of the places where I think uh, asking about what's happening in the home and um, are there sources of stress? Are there things that are particularly difficult right now in the family? And I think the first step would be acknowledging how everybody is in such a state of being triggered, being stressed, being worried and um, talking about are there particular things that are happening in the family that circumstances that they are worried about that the child might be responding to and i think maybe framing this in the context of you have a very sensitive observing child that responds to emotions or might be worrying about things that we are not aware of. Could we think of what might he be thinking about? What does he hear in the TV? What does he hear about the things that are worrying you and your family? So that we, we try to understand the context for the tantrums. And when does the tantrum happen? what triggers the tantrum and then ask how do you respond to the tantrums what have you tried that helps what have you tried that actually makes things worse so that it becomes like a collaborative way of understanding the situation better because we know that behavior always happens in a context the context of the present and the context of the past as well. So trying to understand the context in the case of this little boy, for example, who was playing that he was dead, he had had a huge tantrum when he saw the grandma uh, having um, um, uh, wearing a mask. What, what triggers the tantrum? When does it happen? And is there a common thread among the the different things and i think always uh, the idea of reassurance i know you are having a hard time and i am here and i'm going to help you feel better helping the child the little children can breathe helping the child breathe <gasps> playing bubbles so that because bubbles are a great tool for breathing um and um, helping with relaxation, playing, distraction. Those are a range of tools that we use with numerous tantrums, which are happening all over the place now. So normalizing that many, many children are having repeated tantrums. Let's try to understand how for your child that might be saying what it is that he needs from us.
Thank you for that. We had we have a couple other questions. We're just about out of time. Um, most people are just wanting to know where they can get additional resources. Do you have any suggestions? Um, we've posted your book. Do you have any? Some people were specifically asking for K through six resources. Well, um, one resource uh, for young children uh, that I can and uh, K through sixth grade is not my area of expertise, so I'm, I apologize for that. I don't have it right at my fingertips. I think that Zero to Three has a marvelous website that can be very useful uh, in um, uh, providing strategies. The National Child Traumatic Stress Network uh, for situations that are more serious, nctsn.gov has um, also resources on traumatic stress. And so those those two are resources that I would strongly recommend. Can I add, Alicia? That, yes, Barbara, um, I was going to ask you, and Carla, both of you are wealth of information. Well, I want to I wanna tell people that our new Facebook page, Zero to Five Workforce, Great. we are not only monitoring all of the counties from which you're coming, but we are monitoring all of the sites that Alicia is talking about and putting those resources up on our Facebook page so we can really have them accessible to everybody in one place. So Zero to Five Workforce on Facebook. Thank you, Carla. Um, we're going to try and vet those and do those for you so that you can find them there. That's great. Thank you, Barbara. You and I haven't talked for a couple of weeks. <laughs> this is new to me, so thank you very much. <laughs> All right, our time is up. So we could talk for Thank much you. longer, I'm sure, but we will let you go and you will be receiving, all receiving an email later um, with the slides, with the link to the evaluation, with a link to the replay of this, um, many more opportunities to keep learning. And um, we just wanna thank you so much. Um, thank you and yeah. be safe and well, everybody. May yes. we all be together and as we repair. Bye-bye. Thank you.